So with five kids, I, I live the dad life, okay? My, my, you know, some of the staff, they make fun of me with my dad hats and my dad's sunglasses. And, you know, I've got the king of all dad shoes, the Nike Air Monarchs. And so I wear them proudly because I've just embraced living the dad life. And I noticed that it was getting bad a couple years ago when I was super excited about the new countertops we'd got. We got new granite countertops, and I was like, why am I excited about this? And I was like, I guess it's just, you know, the dad life taking over. And then two summers ago, it got really bad because that was the first time in my life that I was genuinely excited about and focused on my grass, any, any other dads with me there? Like at this time of year, you're like, this is the time. Like we gotta get this thing plugged and seeded and you know, fertilizer and lime and, and the kids gotta stay off of it. We gotta let that stuff grow and grow and grow and then we'll finally cut it. And I just got excited about my grass. And my kids will catch me and they're like, you know, I'm staring off out the window and they're like, what are you looking at, dad? And I'm like, can you not see that new thin sheen of green that's coming in as that new grass is finally coming up? Like I get excited about, I check the weather now. Like I used to be bummed when it rained, right? Like I didn't want it to rain. I wanted it to be sunny every day. But now I'm like, man, we need some rain. This grass is getting dry. I want to have a nice, beautiful yard. And here's the thing about it. I can't grow grass. Nothing that I do can force it to happen. But what I can do is I can, I can put in the work I can create the environment to help the grass grow. And the reason I say all that is because we're starting a new series today called Doing and Being. We're talking about spiritual dis disciplines in our life. And here's the thing, you can't force yourself to be godly. You can't just try harder uh, and, and fruit of the spirit come out in our lives. But there's things that we can do that can create the environment. We can put ourselves in positions to see God move and work and grow in our lives through these spiritual disciplines. That's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about how can we put ourselves in different positions? How can we set the conditions to see godliness grow in all of our lives? We started a series over a month ago called Journey 1224. We're talking about this spiritual journey that we're going on. And what are some things that we need to be doing and being as we go on this journey? Richard Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Disciplines, about spiritual disciplines, uses the same illustration. He says this, he says, a farmer is helpless to grow grain. Farmers can't force grain to grow, right? All they can do is provide the right conditions for the growing of the grain. He cultivates the ground. He plants the seed, he waters the plants, and then the natural forces have to take over, and up comes the grain. This is the way it is with spiritual disciplines. They are a way of sowing into the spirit. By themselves, the spiritual disciplines can do nothing, but they can get us to a place where something can be done where God can begin to move in our lives, growing and molding and, and shaping us into who he wants us to be. And that's the thing about it. If you ever see someone with a beautiful yard, you know, you see it's perfectly landscaped and it's got, it's striped and it's green and it's thick and it's beautiful, that didn't just happen. There was a lot of intentional discipline that took place. There was investment, there was time, there was focus. Because here's the thing, just like our hearts, a yard left to itself, what does it grow? Weeds. It grows bare. It moves from order to disorder. And the same thing is true in our hearts and in our minds. Left alone, they grow weeds. Left alone, they grow bare. Left alone, they grow unhealthy. So... What are some of the things we need to be doing and being? What are the things that need to be present in all of our lives, day in and day out, as we go on this journey to grow in godliness, to become the followers that Jesus wants us to be? Now, that, that phrase, doing and being, it comes from Don Whitney, who also wrote a book on spiritual disciplines, and he once said this in an interview. He said, now, the goal of practicing any given discipline is not about doing as much as it is about being, being like Jesus, being with Jesus. But the biblical way to grow in being more like Jesus is through the rightly motivated doing of biblical spiritual disciplines. And we've said this whole time that 
journey, 1224, is a, a spiritual journey. And one of the things that God has really been doing in my life is moving me to a place of prayer, a greater place of dependence, because this is so big and large and overwhelming and out of our hands that it's forced me to, to go to him more in prayer, doing more of this time to be more like Christ in our trust on this journey. So with that in mind, let's open up to Matthew chapter 6. If we're going to look at prayer, if we're going to look at this first spiritual discipline, there's no greater place for us to look than in Matthew 6 when Jesus says, this is how you pray. Jesus looks at his followers and he lays out this model for how we should be praying in our lives. The Lord's Prayer where Jesus basically boils it down to as simple as possible. This is the focus of our prayers. This is what needs to be present when we pray. And I believe that we can take this and see two things for us to remember and apply. Two things that, that, that should be in our minds and our hearts as we pray. Two things that I hope will help guide and improve and strengthen our prayer lives. And these two things are God's greatness and our weakness. That, that, that prayer is God's greatness meeting our weakness meeting our needs, meeting our desperation. And I believe we see that when what Jesus lays out here. The first half, we see how great God is, right? That he's our Father, that he is holy, that he's in heaven, that it's his will, like that he's in control. And then we see our needs, that we're hungry, that we have different desires and wants, that, that we have temptations and struggles, that we have things to be forgiven of and to forgive others to see God's greatness, meet our weakness. Let's pick it up in verse nine, Matthew chapter six. And Jesus said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as so we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Father, our heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can come to you. God, I pray for all of our hearts and lives that prayer would be the priority. God, in the days and weeks to come that we would cultivate this spiritual discipline. God, that we would put ourselves in a place, in a position, the conditions, God, for you to move and to, to meet with us, to commune with us in times of prayer. God, that we would begin to understand what, what does it mean to, to pray without ceasing, that this would be just the conversation of our hearts and minds as we go through our days. Always running to our Father. Always bringing things before you. Always thanking you praising you, worshiping you. God, move in this. God, grow deep roots into prayer into the days and weeks to come. And we cry out to you, may we see you move like never before in our hearts, our lives, our families, in this church, in our community. God, bless us on this journey. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've shown you the cards Showing you my hand, we, we want to see God's greatness, and we want to see our weakness and how that is the driving force in our prayer. That, that we come first and foremost, that, that our prayer should be focused on, number one, God's greatness. That he is our Father, that he is holy, that he is in heaven, that he has the power, and we need to understand that more and more. And the more we understand and begin to wrap our minds around God's greatness, the more we will be people of prayer. One pastor I read said it this way of these verses, said you can see the difference and you can feel the difference between these two halves. The first three petitions are about God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. The last three are about our food, our forgiveness, our holiness. The first three call to attention God's greatness. The last three call to attention our needs. But so often that's all prayer is on our part, isn't it? Our needs. Our wants, our to-do list, our errands, and there's no mention of God's greatness. There's no focus on who he is, but I believe that when we begin to believe in God's greatness, 
but truly see and understand and allow our minds to wrap around it a little bit more, that's when we become people of prayer. That's when it's our, our initial and only reaction and not just the last result. Man, I've tried all these other things. I mean, I've, I've gone through all of my connections and my abilities, and I, I guess we'll result to prayer. It was Corey Tim Boone that famously said and asked, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is it the, the driving and the direction of our lives or is it what we run to when we find ourselves on the side of the road? If we're honest, so many times it's the spare tire. We'll exhaust all of the other efforts and avenues and then, okay, finally, I guess we need to pray. Instead, of, that's the steering wheel. That's where we drive from. That dictates the direction in our lives. You know, I know the reaction in services like this, in sermons like this. We know we should pray more. If I went around and asked everybody, should you pray more? Absolutely. And we get in these services and we feel bad and we feel guilty. And I heard a pastor one time compare it to a balloon. And you know, if, you, if I were to take a balloon right now and blow it up and tie it, I could smack the balloon up in the air and it would, it would float for a little bit, wouldn't it? It might even go up and seem for a second like it was hovering, but what's that balloon going to do? It's going to fall. And so many times we're like that balloon in services like this, and we go, oh, I know I need to pray more. And guess what? You probably get up and you pray tomorrow because you were in here and we, we smacked you up in the air. Maybe Tuesday. Get to Wednesday, and what's the balloon doing? It's falling. Life's pressing in all of the to-do list, all of the things, all the running around, and, and the balloon begins to fall. And then we get into another service, and we're like, oh, man, and we smack the balloon up in the air. And he said the difference is we don't need to just be smacked up in the air through guilt and a sermon. We need the Holy Spirit to invade our hearts and our minds and let us understand the greatness of God. And then it's like filling the balloon with helium. We fill the balloon with helium, what happens? It takes off its sores, and it's gonna stay up in those rafters. And that's what we need in our lives to understand the greatness of our God, the glory of our God, the holiness of our God, our Father in heaven. And that's who we can run to all day, every day. That's who we can take any petition to, no matter how big or how small. That puts Holy Spirit helium in our lives, doesn't it? That makes, I want to run to him and I want to stay in that place. But do we understand this greatness that's why this has to be our starting point. This has to be our foundation. One pastor I read said this, that to fail to pray then is not to merely break some religious rule. Failure to pray is a failure to treat God as God. Prayer is simply a recognition of the greatness of God. Seeing who he is. Understanding what he's capable of. What he's offered in our lives, the greatness of God and treating him as such. He's our heavenly father. Now you have a father that you can go to. Just like all of my kids right now, when they're in need, they don't try to figure it out. What do they do? They run to me or their mom. Because they know we'll take care of it. We'll meet the need. We'll help out. We'll answer. We have a father who is infinitely greater. He's in heaven and we're on earth. And he's holy and we are not that his will needs to be done, that he's the provider, that he's the forgiver, that he has sent the Savior, that he's the protector, that he is great, and we need to run to him to understand that a little bit more. It's so hard for us so often, isn't it? We focus on the here and now. I heard a teacher one time who was trying to get her class to understand the greatness of God. Just to comprehend a little bit more just how great and big and powerful and awesome he is. And so the teacher took a piece of paper and said, okay, I want you to imagine that the distance from the earth to the sun, about 93 million miles, was represented by the thickness of this paper. So, so we took 93 million miles and we just crunched it down and, and this represents that distance. From our planet to our star, the sun. That if you were to take that and that was the measurement from Earth to the next nearest star, you would need a stack of paper 70 feet high. And remember, each piece of paper in the stack that's 70 feet high represents 93 million miles. That's just from our planet to the next nearest star. And then she said, if you want to take the, the, the diameter of the entire Milky Way galaxy, you would need a stack of paper 310 miles high. 
And each sheet of paper is 93 million miles. And that's just our one tiny little galaxy. She concluded by saying, our galaxy is just a speck of dust in the universe. And yet Jesus holds the universe together by the word of his power. Incomprehensible power incredible glory and strength. Colossians 1.16, for by him, Jesus, all things were created. Every one of those stars, every one of those galaxies in the universe, he created, he spoke, and it happened in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him, and in him all things hold together. Hebrews one, three, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And guess what? He upholds the universe by the word of his power. The teacher concluded and said, is that the kind of person you ask into your life just to be a personal assistant? Is that the kind of person you ignore? Is that the kind of power you just leave there and think, no, 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 I got this, nothing compared to that. And yet, how often do we ignore him? Or how often do we just hand him our to-do list of errands for the day? Hey, take care of this and that. I'll go focus on the big stuff. Instead of seeing he is great. But a lot of us grew up saying little prayers before meals. God is great. God is good. How quickly can we just mouth those words Oh, if we would understand how great God is, how good he is, our lives would be lives of prayer. First, we see here God's greatness. But the second thing we have to see in our prayers, our weakness, understanding how weak we really are. Because so often pride keeps us from praying, doesn't it? Self-sufficiency keeps us from praying. I'll figure it out. I'm strong enough. I'm tough enough. I'm connected enough. I'm resourceful enough. I'm rich enough. I'm whatever enough. We're not enough. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We're in need of a lot of things. We're in need of bread. We're in need of food. We're in need of clothes and shelter, but there's a lot of other things, right, that we're desperately in need of. Forgive us of our debts. We have debts, We have wrongs, we have faults, we have sins, we have failures. As we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation that we face all the time, that we are so weak against, that we fall into and give into so often. But deliver us from evil or from the evil one. The second half of this prayer, it's it's focused on our weakness. That we're unable so often, like I've said, in our pride, in our arrogance, we, we try to put up this facade. I got it all together. I'll take care of it. I'll figure it out. Instead of in humility and honesty coming before this great and powerful father that we have and offering all of these petitions, laying them down before him where we're told to cast our cares onto him. Why? Because he cares for you. How many times do we forfeit that? But I also want us to see here in our weakness, it's not individual. I want us to see the plurality in this part of the prayer. I I believe Jesus is is removing the so common self-centeredness in our prayers. Did you see? He didn't say, give me this day my daily bread. He didn't say to, to pray this, that all of this is plural that he's telling us there. To give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. And if we're honest, how self-centered are our prayer lives so many times? How selfish and, and me-focused, what, what I want, what I desire, instead of really truly living as the church in the body, in community, and knowing what's going on in other people's lives, interceding on their behalf, standing in the gap, lifting them up. It's another great weakness. But this only happens when we're truly aware of our weakness. So that would be another question I would ask in this. How aware are you of how truly weak we are? Of being truly honest and putting down the facade and and truly being open to say, yes, I am weak. 
You know, thinking through my life in a practical example, there's, there's nothing like a major surgery that will show you just how weak you are. Anybody ever been there? I remember a few years ago, I was 25 years old and best shape of my life. I'd done a Spartan race the weekend before and then I, I come in for a brain surgery the next Monday. And coming out of that surgery, being in the neurosurgical ICU for several days, coming home, not being able to drive, not being able to walk by myself, not being able to, to go to the bathroom, to take a bath, to cook, to do, I could sit on a couch. And if I had to do something, somebody had to help me. Like that's humbling in those moments. I can remember sitting there and just crying and God breaking me because I was just so broken of pride in that moment just because of the physical tasks that I couldn't do. And it was like the Holy Spirit was speaking, saying, Skip, this is so much more than those physical tasks. Like, this is the perspective you need to have in all of life. What did Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. But so many times I think I can do most things and I'll just need you for some things, which is the complete opposite prideful perspective. And it's no wonder we don't pray. We truly have to come to a place to understand we can't, and we don't, and he truly needs to be our power. He lists three things here. He lists food, he lists freedom, and he lists forgiveness. Now, are there other things we need to ask for, pray about? Absolutely. But these major things that Jesus points to, and I, I think we can see even more in that prayer for daily food. There's so many other things that we need daily that we need to be praying and asking God for. But so many times we try to be self-sufficient, especially living in American culture, right? There's not many of us who have to pray, I don't know where food's coming from tomorrow. We know because we, we have bank accounts and we have portfolios and we, we, you know, we've saved up and we've worked hard and there's a lot of people who they don't have to think about food or money or resources for the rest of their life. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy and said, warn the rich among you not to trust in their riches. He didn't tell them not to be rich. He said, just don't trust in it because it's not a good God. It doesn't make good and provide everything that you think it should. And, and even in these three things, thinking about Jesus and his life, we don't just see him tell us to pray this. We see him live it out. He's our perfect example, isn't he? So when it comes to the feeding of the 5,000, we have all of these thousands and thousands of people who are hungry. And Jesus gets some loaves and fishes placed into his hand. What does he do? He offers them to God and says thanks to the Father. He prays in that moment for God to provide, and he does. In temptation, he bookends his ministry start to finish in the wilderness and in the garden. He's praying and fasting and going before God to be obedient in all of the temptations he's going to face. What about forgiveness? As he's on the cross, dying for our sins, what's he doing? Praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus lived this out. And we get this right as kids, I think. I was thinking about it this morning as we sing Jesus loves me as, as children in Sunday school in different times, right? Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And somewhere along the lines, we kind of forget that and we think, okay, I'm strong. No, you're still weak. Just as much as we are when we're children compared to him. We are weak and he is strong. And the more we understand that, the more we will be people of prayer. Understanding that his greatness is infinitely greater than any of our weakness. So, to close, I want to ask three practical questions. Yes, God is great. Yes, we are weak. But, but is that showing up in our lives? In the area of prayer, in this spiritual discipline, I want to ask three questions that I believe we see in the context here in verses 5 through 9. When Jesus sets the stage for this, I believe he shows us three questions we can ask. And number one, in your life, is prayer a priority? You can, you can put on the facade. You can fake it when you come in here, but you and God, you know, in your life, if we looked at the receipts from your week and how you spend your time, is prayer really a priority? I see the wheels turning. I see the, the, the 
the processing, the thinking through in many of your lives. Is it a priority? Look at what Jesus says in verse five. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by other. Truly, I say, they receive their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse seven, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for the many words. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask. Pray then like this. And when you pray, and when you pray, and when you pray, pray like this. That Jesus is assuming that we would pray. But so many times, if we're honest, it's not, and when I pray, it's if I pray. If we really looked into our lives, how many times do we, the alarm clock goes off and we're already on the phone and we're checking the emails and we're responding to those messages and we gotta get to the meeting and gotta get the kids there and then life goes by and the end of the day shows up and we haven't spent a second in prayer. So, so is it really a priority? It, can it be said of our lives, when I pray, when I pray, when I pray? Are we serious about it? Tim Keller in his book entitled Prayer he tells a story about when him and his wife really got serious about this. He's been a pastor in New York City for a long time, and pastoring in New York City would be hard enough in and of itself. But this was just after 9-11, so imagine you're pastoring in New York after 9-11. His wife is battling Crohn's disease, and on top of it all, he is diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Like That's a tough season to be in for anybody. And he said his wife came to him and, was, and said, honey, like, we have to get serious about prayer. You and I have to commit to making this a priority and praying together every single day. And she gave him this illustration. She said, imagine we were diagnosed with such a lethal condition that the doctors told us that we would die within hours unless we took a particular medicine. We had to take a pill every night before going to sleep. Imagine that you were told you can never miss it, not once, or you would die. Would you forget? No. Would you just not get around to it one day? Would there be anything that came before it? No, it would be so crucial that you wouldn't forget it. You would never miss it. And then she concluded by saying this, well, if we don't pray together, we're not going to make it because of all we're facing. We have to to pray. We can't let it just slip our minds. That has to be our mentality. For it to be the steering wheel, to not let it get to the point where we've got all of this stuff and oh, let's run to the spare tire, but committing to be that in our lives. F.B. Myers once said, the greatest tragedy in life is not unanswered prayers, but unoffered prayers. How true of so many lives. It's unoffered, unrequested, that James told us you don't have because you don't ask, because we don't live lives of prayer. So is it a priority? Number two, is your prayer pure? Is it pure? Is the motivation, is the heart behind it pure? That's what Jesus is saying there. He talks about the hypocrite. He talks about the Gentile. You know, they're standing on the street corners. They're loud and proud. Hey, look at me. I'm holy. I'm praying. They, they try to just heap up phrases. If I say the right cadence, if I say the right amount, if I do this or that, then God will do what I want him to do. In both of these, it's impure. In one, it's just you know, self-exaltation. In the other, it's manipulation. God, I want God to do what I want him to do like he's a genie in a bottle. And here, I believe we see that Jesus is saying that can't be the way our prayer is. In that passage in James, when he says, you have not because you ask not, he goes on and he says, but you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly. You spend it on your own passions. The heart's not right behind that. There's not an honesty in it, a humility in it. And Jesus, the word there that he uses for hypocrites in the Greek, it, it, it means an actor playing a part. It's where we get our English word for theater. It's like they're just playing a part. And how many times can we just play the part in prayer? Kind of selfishly, flippantly check a box instead of being our life, our hearts. 
our desire. Which leads me to the third question, is, is prayer personal? But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. You feel the intimacy, the closeness, the connection, you and God. And how often do we forfeit that? That we can come into the presence. Scripture tells us we can boldly come before his throne. We pass on it. We let other things take its place. Things that are not worthy. Things that are not even close. Oswald Chambers said, we look at prayer as a means of getting things for ourselves. But the Bible's idea of prayer is that we may get to know God himself. When are you going to go in and shut the door, block out the rest of the world, everything else, just you and God? When's it going to be a priority? When are we really going to run at his greatness in all of our weakness? We can't shut the door right now, but right now you can shut your eyes. You can bow your heads. You can shut off the phones. You can shut off what's next. You can shut off what's this week. Just you and God right here, right now. Right where you sit, I want you to, I want you to go into the room. Shut the door. Let's pray to the Father. All those things you carry. I know you carried weaknesses in here. I know you carried struggles. I know you carried hurts burdens that you felt were going to crush you and you need to lay them down at his feet you, need, you don't need, you need to cast them away that's what the word there to cast your cares on, throw it at him because he cares for you your heavenly father wants to take it he wants to carry it Jesus said come to me all who are burdened and heavy laden I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why? Because he carries it. And as you're there in this posture of prayer, I want to I read one last thing, and I want you to just think. I want you to truly take an inventory of your heart and life. This was written by a man named Elmer Towns, and talks about there's some ways that we can't pray the Lord's Prayer because of sin and different issues in our lives. And maybe right now we need to repent in these different areas. He writes and he says this, he says, if you don't know Christ, you can't pray our Father. And so maybe for you today, that's what, you need to come to Jesus and make him the Lord and Savior of your life, to repent of your sins, to have him come into your life, to adopt you into the family of God so that you can say, my Father. If you glorify yourself, you can't pray, hallowed be your name. If you reject God's rules, you can't pray, your kingdom come. If you won't submit, you can't pray, your will be done. If your life is only for the here and now, you can't pray on earth as it is in heaven. If you think you're self-sufficient, you can't pray, give us our daily bread. If you won't forgive those that have wronged you, you can't pray, forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. If you seek sin, you can't pray, lead us not into temptation. If you're a friend of evil, you can't pray, deliver us from the evil one. If you're trying to build your own kingdom, you can't pray, yours is the kingdom. If you want power, you can't pray, yours is the power. And if you always take the credit, you can't pray, yours is the glory. And maybe there's different points where you need to pray right now and repent. Pray right now and confess. 
to spend time praying. Maybe you need to get on your face. Maybe you want to come to this altar. Maybe you need to pray as a family. Maybe you need to sit. Maybe you need to stand. Whatever it is, let's focus on his greatness. Let's cry out in our weakness. Let's personally go deeper in prayer than we ever have before. Our Father, we thank you that we can come to you. That you are our provider, our sustainer. You are holy. You are in heaven. You are good. You are great. May we understand that more and more. And as we're about to say, may you be enough. And we understand with nothing, we still have everything and we have you. Move in our lives. Make us a people of prayer. In Jesus' name.